We were all teachers. So that's not what I signed up to be when I became a Christian. You didn't have a choice. And the fact still remains is that your life is a teacher to others. Your example before others serves as a, an instrument of education. Kids that are coming behind us, kids that we influence, even in society, you have situations that unfold where kids can look at you and see how you handle yourself specifically, and they are learning what is right and what is wrong, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter number 6. And I want to talk to you today about the doctrine, if you will, of Christian education. What we believe is what we have been discussing over these last several weeks. And today we come to the point of Christian education. You say, well, isn't that something we ought to talk about more in a teacher atmosphere? And in one sense, I would say yes, but in another sense, I would say no. From the standpoint of no, or actually from the standpoint of yes, it's because each and every one of us are teachers. We are all teachers. So that's not what I signed up to be when I became a Christian. You didn't have a choice. And the fact still remains is that your life is a teacher to others. Your example before others serves as a, an instrument of education. But it serves, your life serves as a, an education to other people. Kids that are coming uh, behind us, whether they're kids that we influence. Maybe it's our children, maybe it's our grandchildren, maybe it's our nieces and nephews. Maybe it's other kids in the, in the, in the church but, but even in society, you have situations that unfold where kids can look at you and see how you handle yourself specifically, and they are learning what is right and what is wrong, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And so when we look today at this aspect of church education or Christian education, and what is the church's role? I hope and pray that this will sink into you to help you understand why it is extremely important that the congregation, that the church be about educating people. Uh, and now, and even from today, I really didn't even uh, think about this while I was preparing this message, but maybe, just maybe, through this message today, you might even begin to see why I'm so passionate about trying to get the Word of God out to people that we may never meet and who may never darken the doors of Long Branch Baptist Church, just for the sake of the opportunity. And I dare say that, uh, and, and, I, and this is the last thing I'll say about this, but, but I dare say that if Jesus were walking on the earth today, if Paul, I mean, you imagine, look at the book of Acts and see how just in that short 28 chapters, how Paul was in Ephesus, then he was in the Smyrna, he was in all these different places, and it was all by ship or walking. That was it. They didn't have airplanes. They didn't have cars, taxis, Ubers. You know, they didn't have any of these things that we have. They didn't have telecommunications and internet. Can you imagine with such zeal and, and excitement in their lives back then how much they might get accomplished today for the kingdom of God? And so it's a great opportunity. So I want you to read with me as we look at uh, education, what we believe as Southern Baptist on education. It says here that Christianity is the faith of enlightenment and intelligence. Now, I want to say something real quickly about that. 
there is a belief system out there that believes that you and I Christians are what they call dims. Because we don't accept the societal recognition of evolution. We believe in a biblical model of creation. And because we don't get on board with certain of those types of uh, philosophies, we're considered dims. Uh, we are... Uh, it's interesting how Bill Nye, the science guy, uh, I'll never forget watching the debate between him and, and Ken Ham out of, uh, of, of uh, the creation um, uh, Answers in Genesis out in Kentucky. And what was amazing is to, to hear his, his gripe about Christians and, and, and the fact that we don't necessarily stand on or stand for or agree with evolution, he says, we're talking about people that are going to build bridges who don't believe in science. These are people who are going to be building the buildings. I, I can't even begin in my own mind think about anyone who doesn't believe in evolution is going to be building our, 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 our technology for the future. Well, Bill Nye had to be reminded that Evolutionary science is historical science. It has nothing to do with the ability to manufacture, uh, engineering. All those principles are scientific. They're still the same. And just because I don't necessarily uh, come in with evolutionary historical science doesn't mean that I don't know how to build things. I don't know how to interact in society. But see, that's the, that's the attitude and that's the facade that they want to create for Christians. We, we believe in this archaic mindset. These are things that maybe were, were beneficial in the, 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 the dark ages or, uh, or, or during certain times of history. But we've grown from this. We, we've, we've become so much smarter. Look at all the things that we are able to create. By the way, that sounds an awful lot like the Tower of Babel. We want to come together. God says, go throughout all the earth, replenish the earth, and become a, a global community. And at one time, had they listened to God and done it God's way, everybody today would still be speaking pretty much the same language. But because they said, no, nope, we're going to stay in one spot. And by the way, we're going to build this tower and make a name for us. And by the way, uh, any, any community or any city that you go into that has these huge skyscrapers, that's the main mentality. Because how many kids who grow up in the urban jungle, so to speak, who can barely see the sky above them and birds flying in the air and, and animals, they look at what mankind is able to do. And they forget or miss out on everything that God has already done. <clears throat> so, Christianity is the faith of enlightenment. We're not dims. We're not idiots. In fact, I would dare say that, there's, that if you are a Christian and you're in uh, the academic world, you're probably smarter than most people out there. But it is the faith of enlightenment and intelligence. <laughs> Sorry, keep interrupting myself, but it's funny that how God says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. See, that's why we don't have any reason to uh, be afraid of people who are atheists. All right, back to the message. Christianity is the faith of enlightenment and intelligence. In Jesus Christ... Abide all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All sound learning is, therefore, a part of our Christian heritage. The new birth opens all human faculties and creates a thirst for knowledge. Incidentally, all of the greatest scientists and scientific minds of the past, guess what? They were Christians. Moreover, the cause of education in the kingdom of Christ is coordinate with the cause, causes of missions 
and general benevolence and should receive along with these the liberal support of the churches. That's important for us to understand. Being in Christ not only increases our ability and capacity for knowledge, but it also gives us a reason for what we do with this knowledge that we have. And it, uh, and it translates itself into missions. An adequate system of Christian education is necessary to a complete spiritual program for Christ's people. How important is that statement right there? In Christian education, there should be a proper balance between academic freedom and academic responsibility. Freedom in any orderly relationship of human life is always limited and nevertheless, I'm sorry, and never absolute. The freedom of a teacher in a Christian school, college, or seminary is limited by the preeminence of Jesus Christ, by the authoritative nature of the Scripture, and by the distinct purpose for which the school exists. By the way, some of the biggest names in academia once were created by Christians. Harvard, Christian school. Yale, Christian school. Princeton. In fact, one of the original presidents of the Princeton University was Jonathan Edwards, a great awakening, uh, first great awakening preacher. Unfortunately, our education system today does not reflect what it, it originally intended. And unfortunately, even amongst Christian schools of this day, they do not reflect God's word. You have your Bible open to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want to begin reading in verse number 1. Scripture says, Now this is the commandment, that, uh, this is the, commandment the statutes... And the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it. Now, if you know anything about your Bible, you understand that Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the last book of the general law books. Moses wrote, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these five books. And by virtue of, the, and in somewhat of a chronological order, we see that Genesis, writing everything out, Exodus, God's people being formed and, and, and rescued from Egypt, and now God brings them, Leviticus, it is the, the, the book of law which God is giving to his people to make them a specific type of people, a peculiar people, a people after God's own name. Numbers, the numbering of the, the people of Israel, and then Deuteronomy, which is called the repeating of the law, basically is what it is. And ultimately what Moses is doing, what he is tasked to do at this juncture in Deuteronomy is to prepare the people because they are about to go into the promised land. And when you go into the promised land, think of it in terms of, let's say we were to build a brand new church. And let's just say uh, with, with, with the present sanctuary and the present church that is going on here at Long Branch Baptist Church, maybe there's certain things like, yeah, uh, we have some great memories, but we also had some great disappointments. And the whole idea of, of, of moving into a brand new facility is still, you got this idea of, this is all brand new. No mistakes. We're going to do everything right this time. And that's exactly what... Moses is at least trying to communicate to the congregation of Israel. As you are going into this promised land, there are going to be temptations that you're going to have. There are going to be certain people that are going to try to uh, in, involve you into their uh, false deity worships. And you're going to be raising a generation of children who need to walk in the ways of God. And so you must teach them. You must help them to learn. And so that's where it comes there in verse number one, where he says that these commandments, these statutes, these judgments, this word from God that I'm commanding you to this day, that you may do them in the land where you are going over to possess it. Verse two, so that you and your son and your grandson 
might fear the Lord your God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Now, we have in our midst uh, young girls, and you might say, why does they say son and grandson? What about us? Well, this is the general mindset. Back in this day, this was a, uh, a very male-oriented book. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word that, that, that we would uh, use. Um, almost said patristic, but it's not patristic. That's more of a... a but anyway, it's, 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 it's geared toward where men literally are the ones who made all the decisions in that day. Okay? Bible tells us very clearly in the New Testament that it does not discount our gender. There is neither Jew nor Greek nor male nor female. In the eyes of God, all mankind are equal. Okay? And by being equal, he still has various roles in which he puts upon the people of his church, male and female. And so... Just because it says son and grandson, this also goes for you, daughters and granddaughters. Okay. Verse 3, O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you. Listen to what he's saying here. You need to learn these things so it may be well with you. As you go into the new land, as you go into this new purpose, that it may be well with you. And that you may multiply greatly just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons. And daughters, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and you sh they shall be as frontals on your forehead, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Father, thank you for your word. Speak now to our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're taking notes, number one, listen very carefully. This is what God is telling Moses. Biblical principles are intended to be more than academic proficiency. Let's say that again. I know that sounds almost legal, legalese or, or highfalutin language, but, I, but I, want to, I want to spell this out for you. Biblical principles are intended to be more than academic proficiency. What do I mean by academic proficiency? Well, if you're a student here today, what grades are you making? Oh, I make straight A's. Have you ever been uh, to school with one of those people who are some of the smartest people you ever know, but they have no common sense whatsoever? <laughs> I mean, they, they, they'll get every question on the, on the exams correct. But as far as life is concerned, it just flies right by them. They're the people, if you will, that when you say something to them, they look like a deer caught in headlights. And, and, and everything you just said just splattered on the wall behind you. They, they just completely missed it. Right? So we understand that there is something called academic proficiency. By the way, young people, you still need to make good grades. <laughs> it's important. Because making good grades opens up many opportunities. And plus, it also helps you with your uh, discipline right now, disciplining yourself. But I hesitatingly say, knowing especially that we have teachers in our midst, but straight A's are not the all to end all. See, someone could walk away with a bachelor's degree or even a master's degree or even a doctorate guess what the next question ought to come out of everybody's mouth so what what are you going to do with what you have spent so much time learning and so much money investing in notice that in the statement of faith here christianity is the faith of enlightenment and intelligence and it is 
It's true that in Jesus, it abides all the treasure of wisdom and knowledge. And yes, listen, being born again opens all human faculties and creates a thirst for knowledge. But listen very carefully. Our faith was never meant to be a solitary source of intellectual assent. I know that's big words again, but just listen. Learning from the Bible, coming to church, being in a Sunday school class, or going to Christian, having some form of Christian education, was never meant to be an end in itself. Turn with me over real quickly to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Listen to what Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes in verse 1. He says, Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to perform. Okay? These statutes, this instruction, this education that you are to what? Not learn, but perform. So that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. Look down at verse 5. See, I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. Verse 6. So keep and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So let's just say, let's just say that the United States, and, and I can tell you right now, as far as academics are concerned, we're pretty much behind the curve. <laughs> we, we are way below the, 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 the world or global average. But let's just say, for example, the United States was number one in math scores, in history, uh, uh, in, in, in language skills, and whatever, that they, whatever they judge, if you will, the, the uh, education prowess of the, United, of, of, of the world. Would you say that even though we were academically excelling, looking at our society today, you say, we're not that bright. <laughs> And for all of our learning and all of our education, what good is it? What's the point, right? Now, go back over to chapter 6 and look again. Listen to what the writer here says. This is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you. There's the teaching, the learning, the lecturing, if you will. The opening up of opportunities for knowledge that you may do them. That you may do them. You see, this goes right along with exactly what James wrote in the New Testament. I want you to write this down. James chapter 1, verses 21 to 25. You can go back and look this up yourself, but I want to read it to you real quick. James chapter 1, verses 21 to 25. He says, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But listen to what he says. But prove yourselves, what? Doers of the word. And not hearers only. Deluding themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Have you ever gone to the bathroom, you're getting ready to leave, and, and maybe you're just, everything is far, you're so far ahead, and you're in good shape, and you just go and you look and you notice something in your teeth or whatever, or maybe your hair's out of place, and you say, you know what, about 20 minutes before I go, I'm going to get ta that taken care of. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you're so far ahead, you're ready to go for the most part, but there's certain things about your appearance that, that you just, you know, like, well, okay, I'll take care of that. But guess what? About 20 minutes before you are ready to leave or ready to go get ready, some kind of an emergency gets up. You get a phone call. Uh, your child is sick. Uh, you need to come and pick them up. Or, or such and such is taking place. And all of a sudden, guess what? You have completely forgotten 
what you looked like before you left the house. (laughs) That's what he's talking about. When we go to the Word of God and we see the Word of God speaking to us, God is telling us, deal with this right now. Don't just recognize, ah, you got something stuck in your teeth or or, or your your, your breath stinks or your hair is out of place, so to speak. And he's using this as an illustration for us. There's something that's not right about your life. You told a lie. You stretched the truth. You manipulated the truth. You took something that didn't belong to you. Even though it wasn't a company, you maybe took an extra pen that you shouldn't have taken out of the closet at the the workplace. Maybe you fudged a little bit on on your taxes or or somehow uh, uh, gave someone else the impression. And you get where I'm coming from. Maybe the cashier gives you more change than what you were supposed to get back. And inside, there's a little something that says, you know, you need to do the right thing. Well, you know, I'm already in the car. I'm already down the road. I'll I'll do that next time I go in. Do it right then. That's what God is trying to say. When the word of God comes to you, when the word of God speaks to you and, 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 and informs you of something out of place in your life, deal with it right now. Don't wait. Otherwise, you're going to be embarrassed because you still have something stuck in your teeth. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. There's a former Navy SEAL that I've been listening to recently. And... I've been, because of the absolute amount of things that I am really putting upon myself right now, especially with this, you know, doing things online, uh, whether it be devotionals, Bible studies, and whatnot, and, and I find myself just, just caving under, under so much pressure to get certain things done, but I know that it comes down to discipline. Certain things that I've been comfortable with, I can't continue and, 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 and do well in those particular areas if I continue to maintain the way it's always been. And so one of the things this guy says all the time, he says, you know, discipline is what really brings freedom. Discipline is what brings, discipline restricts you and it, and it causes you, if you will, to, do, to say no to things that you would normally do, say no to or, or say yes to things that you don't want to do. But in the end, if you continue a life of discipline, it literally brings freedom to your life. And that's exactly what James is referring to. One who looks into the perfect law of liberty and abides by it, not having been a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This means this man will be blessed in what he does. That means every time you come to church and you hear a sermon and God speaks to you, do something about it. Don't just walk out saying, well, that's a great message that the preacher brought today. Do something about it. Whether it's coming to the altar at the time of the invitation or whether it's there in your seat, you literally say, from this day forward, here's where I'm going, here's what I want to do. This is an opportunity where you call your pastor and basically say, Pastor, the Lord has been dealing with me about such and such. Can you help me so that I might be able to take that next step in my faith? Don't just hear wisdom. Don't just hear knowledge. Do something with it. Write this down. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. This is what Jesus, no doubt, had in his mind when he was letting his disciples know, all authority is in heaven has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go. I've been given the authority. Now I'm empowering you, so Go. Make disciples of all the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always into the end of the age. You see, we cannot separate the intellectual phase of Christian education from practical performing. And every single time we walk out of the church after hearing a message and we do nothing about the things that we have learned, guess what? You're basically just saying, I, it's... It, I, You know, mental ascent, that's all that I need. No, you need to do something with what you have been taught. Why would anyone pay hundreds or even thousands of dollars for an education that they never use? Can you imagine a person going to law school but then deciding to open up a bakery? You say, well, maybe they decide, maybe they realize that law was not where it was at. Well, then that happens. 
but people who go into becoming a heart specialist, usually, especially by virtue of how much they had to pay for their education, they're going to go into some kind of profession that is going to pay for those bills. And you expect that person, you know, so what, what's the point of having a particular degree if you're not going to use it? And by the way, we would never entrust a professional whose practice was not in keeping with their education. Maybe you know somebody who was a, uh, who went to school for culinary arts. They went to learn to cook, become a chef. But now they open up a law firm? It just doesn't make sense. You would probably not go to a pastor looking for legal advice unless he, in his pastor, had some kind of legal degree. It doesn't make sense. Would you hire an accountant who had no history of tax laws? <laughs> I mean, that's why we have accountants. They've got some idea and they've been trained in the tax laws of our society. Would you go to a doctor who never had medical training? By the way, that's a good indication that, yeah, you might get some information off of YouTube or, uh, uh, or, or the, the Internet, but you need to always check your facts because everybody's a doctor today, right? Everybody's a professional, at least they make themselves out to be. Would you hire a dietitian who did not have some form of official training or licensing? And we all understand that the answer to that is no. So in the end, a degree is only a piece of paper. And what one does with the education makes all the difference. But that paper still represents a satisfactory achievement and proficiency in a specific field. And I said all that to say this, when it comes to Christian education... We say we're part of Long Branch Baptist Church. What difference does that make to the people in this world, in the community? What kind, of a, uh, what kind of a reputation are you strumming up for this church right here? By the way, the church is not the building. The church is you. And so we say we're members of Long Branch Baptist Church, but yet we're doing things of the world and doing things that we know are wrong. What does that say about what education you're getting from this place. We say we are Christians. So what? What difference does that make? What difference does that make in our lives? What difference does it make in the lives of those around us? And what difference does it make for the kingdom of God? You see, this is the crux of what James here is arguing in James chapter 2. If you're still there in James, turn to James chapter 2 real quick. Listen to what he says. And we really quickly begin to see how much our life revolves around not just a profession, but also a living out of our profession. Notice what he says. What use is it, my brethren, verse 14, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works, can that faith save him or can that kind of faith save him? And he's not advocating works-based salvation here, but he's saying if you profess something, you, it ought to change your life. Verse 15, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. And so show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons, in all, they also believe and shudder. But you will, uh, are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, uh, on the altar? By the way, the word justification here is not a salvific justification, but in other words, uh, it was in keeping with his testimony. Verse 22, you see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the message and sent them out, messengers, and sent them uh, out by another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Number two, the Christian life depends on Christian education. 
The Christian life depends on Christian education. Similar to most things in life, knowledge and skills can easily be lost within one or two generations. Let me say that again. Just like most things in life, knowledge and skills can easily be lost within one or two generations. There are certain artisan skills out there that literally have been lost with time. Uh, there's a guy on YouTube that I watch sometimes. His name or his YouTube channel is called Mr. Chickadee. Mr. Chickadee. And, and basically he was a military person who got married, had no formal training of, of how to build houses and how to do things. And here he decides with his wife to go and buy some property. And they are building their home from cutting the timber, hewing out the logs, and doing everything from scratch. And over a three-year period of time, he literally taught himself how to do that. He, found, he had to find out things that had completely been lost by learning them himself. See, our faith is dependent on passing what we know down to subsequent generations. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 2 through 9, is literally a format for teaching the next generation. What do we see here? Well, Christian education is God's word must constantly be a part of of our lives. You see there in verse number one, or verse number two, he says, So that your son and daughter and grandson, or son and grandson, might fear the Lord and uh, your God to keep all his statutes and commandments which I command you all these days for your life, and that your days may be prolonged. So God's truth is literally weaved in and out of our day to day activities. God's truth is seasoned throughout all of our conversations. You know what kind of conversations you're having with people out there in the, in, in the, in the world. It doesn't take long before you talk with them. You're sitting there thinking, I think they're a Christian. I'm like, uh, I'm not sure if they're a Christian or not. Those are things that take place when we are in our day-to-day -day conversations. But God's truth is not a weekly activity for the Christian. And that is church attendance. But God's truth is literally a way of life. Look at verse 7. He says that you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk to them, or talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. One of the things that's in our family, and our kids can pretty much back this up, is the fact that somehow, in some way, we try as a, pa as a father uh, and, and as, as, a, as a mom, we try our best to just weave in and out of our conversations, even the frustrations, even when they get caught doing something that they shouldn't do, try to somehow bring it into a Christian perspective. Christian education must be a priority. It must be taught on every platform available, and we've already discussed that even today. The Bible used to be read, and prayer was once a priority in public schools. I remember even as a kid, where public school had somewhat of a Christian influence. We didn't necessarily pray. We stood up for the Pledge of Allegiance. God was invoked in various... I, I could tell that my teacher prayed. I knew that they went to church and whatnot. Today, that's, that's been pretty much wiped away. We used to not have the problems that we have now. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> I think that there's a direct correlation with what's being taught in our schools and what our society is doing today. Bible reading and prayer in schools didn't always bring people to Christ, but it did promote a proper respect for God and his laws in our society. Write this down in your notes, 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourself approved of God. As a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Now what we need to understand is that this is not just for pastors or Christian educators or, or, or various Christian religious leaders. This is also for the people in the congregation. It's for anyone who professes Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I would argue that what was required for Christian leaders was also intended for the congregation. Look at verses 8 and 9. He says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. Now, what, what's so special about that? This is what the religious leaders did. Your Pharisees, Moses. Moses would literally wear the, 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 the gems of, of, the, of, the, of the, well, the priests, I'm sorry, the, the high priest's 
of that day would literally wear gems that represented all of, the, of Israel. In his hand, he would have, what, or his pocket literally would have uh, what's called an urim and thummim, which helped him to understand what God's will was. He would put scripture references in, in a little box that, that basically stood, that just was, he wore right there between his, his eyes. He would have a necklace or, or, a, or a, a bracelet that literally had scripture written on it. They t- this is what the priests would do. And this is what Moses is saying, you as the congregation of Israel ought to be doing. Now, you saying we need to walk around with a box in our forehead? No, but constantly have the word of God. At a moment's notice, be thinking, be meditating. It's no good for you to have something that is there for everybody else to see, but yet it's not affecting your life. Otherwise, it's just religious garb. So it's not only for pastors and those who make Christianity their profession. It is also for the congregation. The sign on your hand, uh, frontals on your forehead, write them on the doorpost in the house of the house and the gates. Um, you know, growing up, a lot of my friends would have posters of rock bands or so-and-so on their walls. My mom and dad never let me have that stuff on my walls. They were so mean. But you know what? They would have never argued about the fact if I put up a verse of Scripture Why? Because my mind ought to be thinking about God. Having it up on the doorpost, out of the gate, having it all on the walls. What's on our walls today? What's on your walls? Shouldn't take long for anybody to walk in and say, these people know Christ. And it's not just because they have stuff up on their walls. It's because what's on their walls is also in their hearts. Is it possible that church attendance... And learning what the Bible says is not as important to subsequent generations. Why? Because they don't see what most Christians profess with their lips being lived out in their everyday life. That's a question that we all need to think about as we come away from here today. Could it be that subsequent generations are leaving the church because we adults who have been professing Christ are not living out the Christian principles that we so boldly proclaim? You're on Facebook and you want to give a witness for God? Don't just post it for the world to see. Live it in your life. What priority do you place on Christian education in your own life? Because it will first be seen in your personal Bible study. It will then be seen in your faithfulness to church attendance. And it will be further seen in how you conduct your day-to-day activities in business. But most importantly, it will ultimately be seen by others. Let's pray. Father, we have come to know and understand the severity and the importance of Christian education. God, I pray that by virtue of just hearing this message alone has caused each and every one of us today to realize that coming to church is important, but it's not as important as what we take from church. Does the word of God walk out when we walk out? Does the impressions that the Holy Spirit gives to us and the, and the changes that he wants to make in our lives, do opportunities for service, do they go with us or do we leave them behind here at the church? And Lord, do we see the importance of helping to pass on these, tru- these Christian truths, these biblical truths to our children and our grandchildren? God, help us to see how important Christian education is. Lord, that we might do our part to promote it. But Lord, I pray that we as a church will begin to see how important, and not just Long Branch, but the church as a whole, help us to see the importance of educating the believers, that we might invest our time, we might even invest our money in opportunities 
to promote God's truth in our lives and in the lives of those who follow behind us. Now, God, guide us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.